Our scripture lesson today is found in the first chapter of Romans and the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In Romans chapter 1, we read in, starting in verse 15, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, made like unto corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. And may God speak to our hearts and minds through his word this day, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. East is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. Well, that certainly might have seemed to be the way it was in the 19th century, but at the end of the 20th century, the twain has not only met, it, <laughs> the train has collided. East has met west, and it has been quite a jolt, I'm sure, for both. In fact, I suppose that the introduction came before the time of internet and jet planes and television and email, probably came on a very lovely Sabbath morning. The skies were blue, the birds were singing, it was a delightful morning when suddenly the sound of the birds was interrupted by a whistling sound that seemed to descend from above, growing ever louder until it ended in a gigantic explosion, and then another, and another, and another. And soon, Pearl Harbor had been reduced largely to rubble and east met West in a very definite way. We had received an engraved invitation from the Emperor of Japan. Now, many people realize that we were, in the words of FDR, we have been attacked by the Empire of Japan. But those who saw things more deeply would have realized that behind the military or economic might of Japan, there lay the force, 
that motivated that, which was the Shinto religion, which believed that the emperor was God, at least his descendant, and the people of Japan were his people. And therefore, they could have the audacity to take on a nation many times larger than they because it was not possible that they could lose because God was their emperor. And four years later, after two much louder explosions, and after Hiroshima and then Nagasaki vanished from the face of the earth, with a battleship in Tokyo Harbor, the Empire of Japan surrendered, and the emperor on radio for all the world to hear confessed that, alas, he was no god. And the Shinto religion collapsed overnight. And then four years later, the Confucian religion, another religion Americans were, for the most part, really only coming to know something about, was overwhelmed by the masses of communist soldiers led by Mao Zedong until practically the last vestige of Confucianism had been smashed into the dirt. And that left three of the five great Eastern religions that were meeting the West primarily in the 20th century. Namely, as we move from East through Japan and then China and now on to Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam. Now they have not involved wars but they have brought a great deal of confusion to a great many people, I'm sure over there as well as over here. What about all those other gods has been a question that millions of Americans have asked. Are they real? Are they false? What should we think? Well, some people have said, well, you see, there's really just one religion, <clears throat> and with different faces, and we're all basically going to the same God through different paths. And this was a way that we could sort of tone down any conflicts that might exist. But then people began to look at them a little bit more carefully. And we discover that of those three, Buddhism, Hinduism and Islam, that Islam is a radical monotheistic religion, which means that it believes very definitely in only one God and makes no room in that unitary God for even the Christian Trinity. Whereas right next door, where Islam abuts India, we have Hinduism, where there have anywhere from 300,000 to 3 million gods. Nobody really knows for sure. But if you keep going east, you run into Buddhism and they have no god at all, at least most of them. Some, however, couldn't quite handle that, so eventually they tried to make a god out of Buddha. But for the most part, they are skeptical about the question of God as Buddha was. In fact, in 1993 in Chicago at the World Parliament of World Religions, 6,000 people from all over the world gathered to try to straighten out the mess, solve the problem and figure out just what really was going on. And after weeks of study, they finally released their paper which was going to explain to us about God and religion. If you read that paper, you'll notice something very strange. The word God or the word gods is never once mentioned. 
You see, the Buddhist priests wouldn't allow it because they don't believe in one or many. And they said, when we pray, we are just meditating. It's psychology. And the only person that hears our prayers, they said, is we ourselves. So, what was the solution? There was none. All they did was come up with some ethical suggestions. So religion had dissolved entirely, leaving nothing but ethics at the world parliament of religion. Isn't that ironic, to say the least? And certainly, that world parliament was the death knell of this idea that all religions are basically the same. That is an option that just does not remain open to any rational being. Well then, if they're not all the same, what are they? As we read today, Paul said that the things which the Gentiles or the heathen sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, actually, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. Now, you remember that this is certainly the view that's held all the way through the Old Testament. There are some today that, that we should bow down and, and reverence all of these other religions. Question. Was that the attitude of Elijah on Mount Carmel? And the false prophets, the prophets of the pagan god Baal, who showed themselves to be false prophets, and Elijah commanded that they be destroyed? Was that the attitude of the Jewish people toward Dagon, the fish god, who fell flat on his face in their own temple when the Ark of the Lord arrived, and how about Moloch, that detestable Semitic God, that right outside the walls of Jerusalem at one time, they had their sacrifices. They had a gigantic metal image of Moloch, and it was hollow. And on certain festival occasions, they would build a gigantic bonfire inside it until it glowed red hot. And then into its red hot, glowing, outstretched hands, they would place their babies and beat louder on the drums so that their screams could not be heard. By the way, when the Jews destroyed that, finally, they made it into the garbage heap of Jerusalem. It's in the Valley of Hinnom. The valley is the word geh in Hebrew, geh hinna. Hinnom is the Valley of Hinnom. We say it as Gehenna, which is one of the words for hell. So this place of worship for one of the pagan gods of this world is a place that Jesus chose as a description of hell. Hardly an attitude of reverence by any means. Godet, a great Swiss theologian, put it this way. Paul says about the matter which vitally concerns him, Jupiter, Apollo, Venus, which were the pagan gods of that time, are certainly not real beings, but Satan is real. And behind that mythological phantasmagoria, there lie concealed malignant powers, which without being divinities, are nevertheless very real and very active. They are demons or fallen angels, the minions of Satan. Princeton Theological Seminary boasted Dr. Professor Charles Hodge, the greatest of all American theologians, 
And he said this, men of the world do not intend to serve Satan when they break the laws of God in their pursuit of the objects of their desire. Still, in so doing, they are really obeying the will of that great adversary, yielding to his impulses and fulfilling his designs. He is therefore said to be the God of this world. To him, all sin is an offering and an homage. We are shut up, therefore, to the necessity of worshiping God or Satan. This is our only option. <clears throat> there are thousands of varieties of pagan religions, but they all really boil down to one. I am, of course, excluding Christianity, which is the largest religion in the world by far, and which is not really religion in the truest sense of that word. It is a relationship between God and the people that he has called to himself. And in all pagan religions, there is one underlying reality. And that is that essentially people are worshiping without knowing it. These demons or fallen angels and all of their efforts are always efforts to try to effect their own salvation. The great two questions that religion asks is, who is God and how can I be with him forever? God and salvation. And all pagan religion, though it is in all of that phantasmagoria confusing and complexing, nevertheless boils down to man's effort to save himself. So the worship is given to the creature, and it is the creature's efforts to save himself that all of their hopes are built upon, as opposed to Christ, who is the living God, who has proved himself such by his resurrection from the dead, and who freely gives eternal life by his grace as a gift to all of those that will trust in him. So the two religions, the only two that exist on this planet, are diametrically opposite to each other. And therefore, what is our attitude to be toward this? Well, we live in a very tolerant age. Netlin describes something about that that we need to understand. There are three kinds of tolerance. First, there is legal tolerance, which means that legally in this nation, we tolerate all religion or none. In America, anyone can hold any religion he wants or none at all, and he can proclaim it from the highest rooftop or from the highest radio tower. That is legal toleration. It is not illegal to be of any religious persuasion in this country. Dear friends, that is not true in all of the nations of this world. It is illegal in Saudi Arabia to worship any other god but Allah. There is persecution and oppression in numerous countries for worshiping other gods. Christians are being burned, crucified, tortured, Healed in nations like the Sudan for refusing to accept Islam. No, the matter of legal toleration is an incomparably valuable treasure that we have in this nation. That as far as institutions are concerned, that the government has no power to enforce anybody's participation in any religion or in no religion, and that we would always want to fight for. Secondly, there is social tolerance, which means, as it has always meant in America, putting up with ideas that we don't agree with. And certainly every American citizen for several hundreds of years has realized that 
And certainly Christians ought to endorse that more than average. We should not only put up with error in other people's views, we should do it graciously, and we should do it lovingly, and we should do it kindly. We are to love even our enemies, even if they are hostile. We are to love them. And we're not to shout or scream or curse or do any of the things that some people do when they hear something that they don't like. So there's legal tolerance and social tolerance. Thirdly, there is intellectual tolerance. And this is a new idea. It's only just being developed in this country. It is totally foreign to historical America. And the idea there is that we are not only to accept other persons, but we are to accept every other view, whether it is intellectual or moral, as being equally true with every other view. That's all part of moral relativism. And therefore, we're not only, as they're pushing now in our colleges, to accept them as true, but we are to encourage each of them equally. And the idea that we would accept one religion more than another is totally unacceptable to the people who insist on political correctness today. But political correctness, which really I guess got going about 15 years ago, and I remember when I first heard about it, that on our campuses they were trying to force students to accept every view as, as equally right. I thought that is the most ridiculous and absurd thing I've ever heard of in my life. Surely in a year or two that will disappear. Well, my friends, exactly the opposite has happened. In the last decade or more, it has become more and more entrenched and stronger and stronger, and it has been elevated to a new level. It's called hate crimes. And if you think that's no threat, may I say that they have, such laws have been passed in a number of states, and we came that close to having the federal Congress pass a hate crime bill. Happily, by a small margin, it was defeated. That would be the first time in the history of this nation that the intents of the heart were thought to be subject to the judgments of men, and that crime could be not merely an act, but also an emotion. Now, friends, if we were to pass laws against hate crimes, you will then find, and this is already in process, that that hate crime is seen to be no more just in deed, but that we have hate speech. Since hate is an attitude of the heart, it may manifest itself in deeds or in words or in thought. Now, does that remind you of any book? How about a very famous book by a man named George Orwell, entitled 1984? And in that Orwellian utopia, you had something called thought police. Remember that? You think it couldn't happen? My friends, it has already happened. In countries like the Soviet Union and the past, China today, and other countries, words or thoughts can be enough to have you thrown in prison. If you were to go to Saudi Arabia and criticize the Quran, their Bible, that is a hate speech crime. Now, do you ever hear the Bible criticized in America? <laughs> of course, many times. But you wouldn't do it in Saudi Arabia. Let's take that back. 
you wouldn't do it twice. Because you see, it is a capital crime. Not only that, the state urges the populace to execute the sentence on the spot where the crime has just occurred. That's where hate crimes can and have and are leading to in certain parts of our world today. And I think the American people are being led by the nose by certain intellectual elites who step by step are passing things where they have their long range agenda very clearly worked out in their minds. Christianity, of course, does not believe in that sort of thing. In America, we believe in free speech. We have something else that has arisen in recent years. A new right has been discovered. Happily, it hasn't reached the Supreme Court yet to receive the imprimatur of our government, but it is claimed as a right. I'm sure that many of you have heard it, and that is the right not to be offended. You offend me. That offends me. I don't like that. That is an offense to me. You see, I have a right not to be offended. Oh, really? This, where did that right come from? If somebody were to say that to me, I think I would say to him, my friend, this, in case you hadn't noticed, is America. There are countries where such a right as that exists. China, former Soviet Union, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, where those people, at least the Muslim part of the population, claim and have that legal right not to be offended. Should you say anything about Mohammed or anything about the Quran or anything about Islam? that offends their sensibilities, you are a criminal. And in some cases, you are guilty of a capital crime. But not in America. <laughs> At least not yet. What about those other gods? What about the conflicts? What are we to think? Well, my dear friends, may I say that Christianity solves those apparent difficulties. The one God of Islam, the millions of the Hindus, the none of skeptical Buddhism, Christ solves the one and the many. We believe in one God, but within it, there are three persons. And so the great religious and philosophical question of the one and the many is solved in Jesus Christ. The question, the problem of Buddha and Buddhism, which is one of skepticism that they believe in no God because there was no evidence, is solved in Jesus Christ who came into this world, who died and rose again from the dead and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs dispels all of that evidence. And on the cold stone of an empty tomb, we can take all of our doubts and dash them to pieces. Christ arose from the dead. So those problems are solved, the one and the many and the doubt. And as far as salvation is concerned, it is not based upon what we do. All of those thousands of other pagan religions all base finally their view upon what things we do. Saying so many prayers, doing this, doing that, and the other thing. It all gets down to self. And ultimately, what do all of those religions believe in? They believe in self. They will be their own savior because they have none other and they will save themselves by their good works because there is no other way. 
There is no divine redeemer that came from heaven. There is no divine savior that went to a cross and took upon himself the guilt of our sins and endured the wrath of his father in our place and paid for the penalty of our sin and offers freely to us the gift, the gift of eternal life. Totally different and marvelously free and offer to all graciously and lovingly it is offered to everyone. But to those people for whom you cannot even mention the name of Jesus Christ without their saying, that offends me. By the way, how many of you have not heard tens of thousands of times the name of Jesus Christ taken in vain by blasphemous people. That offends the heart of every person that loves Christ. And yet, we believe in free speech. We believe in liberty. We would try to say to that person, ah, dear one, what you say cuts me to the heart. You have a right to say it, but you're talking about that one that I love more than anyone in this world. And I would urge you to remember that he died, that we might have eternal life, and he offers it to you as well. But for those for whom the very mention of Christ is an offense, I sometimes feel <clears throat> that what I would like to say his dear friend, in case you haven't noticed that in America, over 200 years ago, we gave up any supposed right not to be offended by anything anybody might say when we accepted the right of freedom of speech. You can't have both, you've got to choose one or the other, and if everything offends you, then I would suggest you're in the wrong place. You ought to pack up your offense and ship it off to China. <laughs> and leave us alone, won't you stand? Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we thank thee that thou art the solution to every moral problem, every theological problem, every philosophical problem, all of the problems of this world. We pray, O oh God, that we may be bold in proclaiming thy name. Help us to do it graciously and kindly, and yet help us to do it boldly for thy sake. But we ask it in thy holy name. Amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.